cannot. Hey there, from Music Direct and MusicDirect.com on Facebook. This is Conversations from the Listening Room. It's Best Navarre, brand ambassador for Music Direct and MusicDirect.com. Good to have you with us on this Thursday here in Internet Land and on Facebook. We do hope that wherever you may be, you're doing well and that you are healthy and happy and all that other good stuff that comes with uh, doing uh, projects like this uh, to say hello to you. Uh, just a bit of advice, if you are watching on any of our other streams and you have a question for our guests, because we are doing this live, you do want to jump over to the Music Direct page and visit our video there uh, to ask the guests a question on whatever it is that you'd like to throw at us. Uh, and uh, we'll certainly do our best to answer them to you in the time allowed. Uh, also, if you've never heard of Music Direct, you are now. So you certainly want to visit our webpage at musicdirect.com. Uh, if you're joining us socially on Facebook, we're also available on Twitter and Instagram for being part of this very unique community, uh, community of music lovers and audio gear hub buffs from around the world. So great to have you with us on this broadcast. When Conversations started off, it was basically an offshoot of an article written by my colleague Josh Bazaar. It is featured as one of our news articles on our homepage. And in the 30-plus articles that he wrote, along with guest spots from Ken Kessler and the like, everyone began to really give a little bit of themselves and their stories on how music and the audio equipment that they hold on to so dearly, especially during times like this, become part of their story. And that's why Conversations was created, gave us a chance to really you know, break barriers and talk to people around the world and in our industry who have some stories of their own that they want to share and you know, kind of say, hey, the world is good. We're all living it. And we're going to get through this one piece at a time. And my next guest, the outstanding Ivana Manley, is someone that I've been dying to interview at length. Um, her... Her place in this industry is nothing short of spectacular. Yeah, she's been referred to some as the manly tube queen, America's goddess of thermionic emissions, although she prefers the more humble title of tube chick. The ever-passionate designer possesses a lively spirit through the legacy of the iconic brand that bears her name. With deep audio roots, uh, she is the daughter of Ampeg owner Albert Dare. Uh, Ivana traveled as a 20 year old from the East Coast to California to join David and Luke Manley, devising tube amp products at VTL. By 1993, however, launching Manley Labs, she ended up assuming con full control of the company. By 1999, uh, by 1999, excuse me, more than two decades later, she continues to handcraft gear that conveys the magic of tube amplification. With Ivana, tubes rule. And she joins <laughs> us from the lovely background that can only be tube heaven. <laughs> Ivana, how are you? I'm doing great today. How are you, Bess? Good. I see you're uh, you're sporting one of your awesome microphones. What is what mic is that in particular? Uh, this is a Manly Reference Cardioid mic. It's our best selling product that we make. We sell hundreds of these around the world every year, and um, they we've been building them since 1990, actually. And so it's kind of funny, a company known for tube amplifiers and audiophile gear and um, pro audio, you know, equalizers and things like that. Our most popular product we make is this microphone. <laughs> That's wonderful. So, of course, I have to ask our, our guest our opening question, uh, given the tenor of what's been going on since March. Number one, how are you? And number two, how is the health and well-being of your co-workers, family members, is everything going pretty smoothly since that time? That's uh, absolutely. You know, I, I flew to France, to Nice, on March 2nd. And so I was just dropped in very close to northern Italy where the coronavirus was just exploding there. And the first night I, I got to Nice to work with my international sales director there, we were watching the French news and it's like, Oh my God, this coronavirus thing is super serious. So, uh, we need to get on this right now. So I, I got in touch with gamma at my factory who runs my factory and said, you guys got to get serious about this right now. We need to disinfect everything like several times a day. 
we need to all wear masks. We need to wear gloves. We need to, you know, uh, have hand sanitizer and all, you know, open up all the inside doors and don't use the break room and all that. So March 3rd, my team got serious about this and we started all those practices back then. And, you know, I think it was, sometimes I wonder like, oh, I shouldn't have really gone to France at that time. Um, but actually I'm glad I did because seeing it firsthand there, um, I was able to educate my employees and then they were able to take that mentality home with them and, and do those behaviors at home very early on. And thus nobody in my team has gotten infected with coronavirus. So I, I think it all worked out. And, uh, we, we shut down the factory pretty much, um, when the governor said to shut down, although we were kind of deemed an essential service, not just because of equipment we make for broadcast, which is maybe a tiny bit, but, uh, we also make a lot of equipment that allows people to work from home. You know, if they can't go into the recording studio, they could, you know, they might need to buy a microphone or something like that. So we stayed open on a very limited basis, um, in March and April and May. And we just brought all our assembly people back, uh, this past Monday. So, um, we had some guys building stuff at home and we had everyone who was able to work at home, stay at home. Um, the R and D team, the engineers are still working from home as is it and data management and admin. Cause we don't, I don't, I don't have to be at the factory every day to do what I do, which is a lot of, this <laughs> <laughs> and, and a lot I, of I, I will this say, ty typing emails typing. ah yes typing but yeah I, I, so so I, we're good in um we've installed picnic tables outside and shade structures for the employees so they can eat lunch outside and practice uh distant distant i social distancing is a bit of a misnomer let's just call it physical distancing <laughs> um and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. guys are back you're, at work. They're spread length, out. If you're an arm's length, you're enough that, you know, that, that's yeah. the rule of thumb. So that we've got, you know, plastic barricades between workstations and we've got, you know, plenty of toilet paper and, uh, sanitizer and special COVID-19 rated disinfectant and all that kind of stuff. So that's great. That's great. Yeah. And I, I love your fast reaction to it. I mean, the fact that you could see it from a global perspective and its expectation to hit the States as it did and how your company rose to the occasion on that. What's even better is hearing what you've just stated that, and, and it's that you're you know, literally at full force again, but you have enough of your personnel who are already established within home offices to do the kind of design work and to address the issues in the production of your products. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's spe spectacular. Yeah. You know, we've, we've been big about, um, database, uh, creation, and we've been changing our ERP system. That's the, all the databases and software that's used to drive the company from within. We've, we've been working for the last year on upgrading all of those systems and changing, changing things. So a lot of that enables us to easily work from home because it's all, I, I, I've made a big push over the last couple of years to get everything off the the drives at the factory, get everything off of people's computers and embrace the cloud. We got everyone on Gmail like two years ago, that kind of stuff. So all that boring internal stuff I've um, been upgrading for the last couple of years, which helped <laughs> us survive this very easily. Uh, Not easily, but better than it could have been. <laughs> well, you know, that's better than some, you know, some other companies that are probably still doing things on pen and paper, but we do have to give them some cred because at least they're, they're also doing their best to survive during these very unusual times. Good to know. Good to know. Thanks for that update. So Ivana Dare is a 20 year. Dore, oh. like a doorway. Dore. Uh, Dore. Dore, c'était au nom français. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that English lesson. Okay, so <laughs> you are a 20-year-old at Columbia University in New York. Before fate drew a hand on you and made you go west, what was 
the tipping point? What made you feel the urge to change? And don't don't tell me it was the New York weather because if it is, <laughs> that was part of it. <laughs> okay, um, a major problem was dollars. Okay, my dad was really struggling to uh, put put me and my sister through school at the same time. And she was at Boston college. And back then, um, my tuition, I think was only 14,000 bucks a year at Columbia, (laughs) but it was still a lot of money in the late eighties. And dad, he was a bit of a con man. I'll just say that in the time that, that we lived with him, he was my stepdad. Um, he, he was kind of, borrowing money from other people, uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul type of thing. So, uh, I'd show it and he was, he was a liar as well. So he'd say, Oh yeah, I sent the money and I'd show up to registration and no money had hit, you know, my escrow account at Columbia. So, um, that was one factor. Like I knew that, um, I needed to go earn some money so I could finish my degree. That was one thing. Secondly, but well, yeah, what really got me was one day in a music class, um, Bill Graham, the concert promoter came and taught our class and it was amazing. Cause I knew who that guy was. He's, he's the opening voice on my big brother and the holding company record, you know, and I'm sitting in the front row and there's Bill Graham telling us about the music industry. And I got this idea, this light bulb went off in my head right then and there like, oh my God, I'm going to take next semester off. I'm going to drive to California. I'm sick of this New York weather. Yes. <laughs> and um, I'm going to go go to San Francisco, wherever Bill Graham presents is, and uh, try to talk myself into some, some menial job. So that was my plan. Um, what happened, what actually happened was I drove across the country in my, in my Volkswagen Beetle, uh, a 69 beetle in case young people maybe aren't aware of old beetles, but that's what I still have. Okay. We have a young um, audience here, Ivana. Age is nothing. <laughs> uh, that's true. Audi- audio files are tend to be older. Okay. Um, <laughs> older than me. Okay. Um, so I drove across the country. I stopped in LA to uh, do a three week job for my, old high school band director. And that was an inventory job, uh, to, to take inventory of this sheet music that he had at his business. So I stopped in LA and I thought, you know, I might as well see what's going on here. And so dad gave me three names of three Ampeg guys that had worked for him like 20 years prior. And it's the famous story. You know, the first guy did not pick up the phone. This is in 1989, no cell phones or whatever. First guy didn't pick up. Second guy who was at Fender, um, talked to me and, um, called me back a week later and said, you know, why don't you talk to these two crazy South Africans out in Chino building tube gear? And I was like, that sounds weird. (laughs) But I, I called up David Manley and, uh, drove out to Chino amongst all the cows at the time. A lot of cows, like 300,000 cows and 80,000 people. Yeah. Anyway, I met David Manley, I met Luke, and I walked into the vacuum tube logic of America factory, you know, looking at all these metal things. And I'm like, what are those? Are those like receivers or something? And they're like, those are vacuum tube mono blocks. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then they, uh, they hired me on as, as the lowest rung on the lowest rung ladder. And I, I sat down at an assembly station, you know, two days later and, uh, my Mexican coworkers were teaching me how to solder. That's how it started. That's a great journey. Now we fast forward to the point where events cause a very unique shift in the management of the company. You have an opportunity to take the lead. What, you know, what must've been going through your mind on, an emotional level on a professional level. This, this is all new for a kid who after a period of time now has to become, you know, basically an owner of a company. Well, um, 
yeah, we skipped a bit. It it ended up that David and I got married, and in those early years, I was very active and and proactive in developing new systems for the business. Um, you know, like an inventory system or parts ordering system. These are on paper. These are things that didn't quite exist at the time. You know, if you needed a part, you just tell Luke to, Hey, we're out of these resistors and he'd maybe order them. And so I was very active running the company from, from within in helping organize the company. Um, I got on the QC bench. I was testing all the pro audio products out in the early nineties and so on. So yeah. Um, eventually David Manley, he had some issues. He was alcoholic. He was also undiagnosed bipolar disorder. And in 1996, he decided to move to France and he didn't want a part of any of this anymore. So, um, at that point, I was already running what was now Manly Labs, and but emotionally, that was very difficult for me because I was very young and I didn't under I didn't understand too much about alcoholism. Um, I did uh, none of us were aware of the uh, manic depression issue there with him, and it was just insanity to be honest. I mean, it was moving goalposts drunken, you know, 20 feet of drunken faxes puked out in my office at home, you know, every night when I'd get home. Uh, it was, it was insanity, but I was already running the company at that time. Emotionally, once I figured out that I didn't need to suffer through this verbal abuse anymore, like I could hang up the phone when he was calling me and screaming at me, drunken, and I realized I actually had power to get away from this. I didn't have to stay in it. Then, then I kind of, I, I grew some anger within me, but I used that emotion. I used that anger to fuel me to work really hard. And it was kind of a motivation of revenge through success. Okay. So it's like, I'll show you, we're going to kick ass. We're going to design these awesome products that were better than what you were doing. We're going to sell more. We're going to be happier. We're going to rock, you know? So that was like this, it came from this anger inside, like, of you know, of getting let down, you know, having someone jump off the team as it were and on, in the heartache and all that. But I turned it, it, I let that, I let that negative energy fuel positive energy is what happened there. And I learned a lot in that process. And rightfully so, because now that I look at your company, having observed its growth <laughs> and a number of its great successes, uh, both in the consumer side, which is what we represent, and the pro side, which has been really baked into the mindset of a lot of great recording engineers, broadcast people, they're seeing it as your products is being pretty much the holy grail for them in terms of sound quality and performance. And uh, I have to applaud you for that. But, but the question I, I do have, you know, now that you're in the year 2020, is the balancing act of professional audio and consumer audio must be an interesting thing because you have these sides of people who have a focus on making sure audio quality is everything to them for every moment that they're talking on that beautiful mic of yours and through the preamps and all the other compressors and other devices that, that you know, hit our world for musicians, for others. While on this side, it's a pretty, you know, sedentary bunch of people unless they found something <laughs> to them is the holy grail. And they just want to sort of go, ah, you know, you know, it's a manly hemp, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Does... Does your team or you as a designer, as a thinker, do you look into those into those different streams and say, I know we can keep this going. I know that this is a good product for this guy and for this gal. What what goes on in that in that engineering mind of yours in the think tank you know, over over at Manly when it when a product comes to market? It sonically, I, I I always say that the audiophile worlds and the recording worlds, they meet in the mastering studio. So, um, overall we go for a fairly neutral sound in most everything that we build and even more neutral in the audiophile side of things. Um, you'll see fewer 
input transformers, output transformers, you know, in the line level products, in the audiophile stuff, because the transformers add color, they add a sound. In a recording sense, when you're trying to create a sound, you might want to create that sound with this color in it, okay, this extra beefiness or whatever. When you're playing it back, uh, in my view, you shouldn't really be adding anything. It should be an enjoyable experience, but you're not just, you're not re-equalizing the sound with extra stuff that's going to color it. it. And so working together with mastering studios for decades, um, in fact, the first studio I ever went in in 1989 was Precision Mastering in Hollywood. And to get to sit there with, at the time he had... Um, Infinity Kappa Nines as his main monitor. And he had some of our big tube amplifiers. And it was an amazing experience to be in a in an acoustically, you know, good environment to be able to really hear how things sound right off the master tape. Kappa Nine so, was his monitor? My yeah. Yeah. They, they sounded so cool at the time. He changed it up later on, but in the early 90s, that's what he was using. So um, I used to use that studio as my sonic reference. You know, I remember going down there with a whole bunch of George Cardis's power cables one day, and Stephen and I, like, listened to power cables all day because there was a, you know, highly resolve, resolving audio file system there, so... That's that's what I'm that's what I'm talking about. Like that's that's where I think pro audio and audiophile worlds converge is mastering studio. So I've always leaned heavily on mastering engineers and mastering studios to make decisions. Like their studio will sound better than my living room. I know that. So that's why, you know, I if I have to do critical evaluation, I'll go down to any number of my friends in Hollywood. Um and listen in their mastering studio. With Manly on the consumer side, and we should point out that Music Direct only in the past uh, year has uh, signed on as a Manly account. Uh, we're very excited about it. We're, you know, we're looking forward to building things into the, into the uh, inventory uh, and when you visit our website at musicdirect.com. But I, I, the question that I have here is Manly products do one thing and one thing great, and that is deliver the kind of sound that has had people like myself, uh, whether I'm an end user or, 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 or visiting showrooms in various other exhibits uh, at shows that sadly are you know, postponed, <laughs> um, to, to hear that sumptuousness, to hear that natural sound that you speak of. But I grew up as the son of a graphic designer who caught the bug in the late 1960s and schlepped home after getting rid of his Ampex console, which had a really nice open reel deck on it. It was mid-century modern cabinet. It was really cool. <laughs> and he comes home with a Macintosh 240 amplifier, a C22 preamp, a Thorns TD-124 turntable with what I think was a Pickering stylus on it. I'll have to ask him. And, uh, and Alltech Lansing Valencia's. So, you know, there's your, there's my indoctrination. Fast forward to my now 25 years here at Music Direct, and I still play the game of confusion. And then, which I'm like, do I bring on this amplifier? Do I bring on this piece of equipment? It's, it, you know, I've been trying to find that happy medium that makes me so happy. So the question for you is, you've said, and this has been, you know, out there in the universe, tubes rule. Why? <laughs> because they're awesome tubes rule because i i think the primary reason tubes rule is because they do work on high voltages high voltage rails and so they by nature will have a lot more headroom than something that's only working on plus and minus say 15 volts like a 30 30 volt spread there we're working on sometimes like Inline level stuff, 300 volts, say, or with the power amplifiers, you know, 500 volts or something. So having having all that, all that headroom is coming from that voltage, put it that way. And additionally, like traditionally, our power supply designs have been really heavy on capacitance and storage. And David Benley used to talk about this, about joules of energy storage and that 
providing like a, a, a reservoir for a fast impact of sound. So we've always been able to get a really fast, punchy sound, minimum color, and huge headroom. And, and as you know, if you're a guitar player, which I'm not, um, I'm a saxophone and clarinet player. If, if you're playing guitar and you're driving the tubes into distortion, you know that that distortion sounds great. It sounds pleasing. It sounds desirable. And that's coming from the way that vacuum tubes, when they're, when you are pushing them, they're going to clip very gracefully and sound beautiful into that transition going into that, as opposed to, you know, solid state devices or, well, we won't even talk about digital, but you, you've got a, a hard clip, you know, it's like on and nothing, you know, it's, I'll refrain from using bad words in public. Okay. <laughs> so that's. I, th those are a couple reasons right there why tubes rule. I mean, besides that, uh, you know, I also like they work with high impedances. So sometimes like when you're coupling between circuits, you can use a lower value capacitor cause you're working in higher impedances. And for instance, you can use a film capacitor instead of uh, tantalum or electrolytic cause you just need a small value and those those can typically sound better than the equivalent kind of part in a different technology, say. And I, I've done those capacitor shootout tests before, and they're remarkable. I remember doing a shootout. I took a bag full of capacitors down to Jackson Brown Studio in the early 1990s, and we just started soldering in caps, and we played off a master tape all day listening and comparing like the sound of that cap versus that capacitor. And in the end, I chose the, the reliable cap, the rel cap multi cap at the time it was the MIT multi cap. And I made that decision that day with some other recording engineers. Like we all listened to this and we all heard pretty much the same thing. We discussed it. And today we still use those same capacitors in those same circuits. So um, yeah, there you go. Uh, better sounding parts associated around the tubes. That's another reason why tubes roll. I, I'll, I'll stick to the, uh, to the wonderful freight, better, better music through tubes, um, and, and, and enjoy it from there. Going back to the business of, of product design, I think if there's one thing that I have to say that separates the manly look from just about every other piece of equipment out there is it's not your conventional box and cage. It's not your you know, staid kind of appearance that some manufacturers have chosen. Yes, there are. Like a toaster oven box? <laughs> no, it's not a toaster oven box. Well, yes, uh, but, but, but at the same, you know, on, on the same token, I look at your products as a kind of neoclassical or, or uh, you know, very un, you know, unpretentious kind of look also because everything is so, you know, shaped, uh, shaped out. Does that also play into the product design in terms of wiring and other other factors to your equipment? It has a, it has sometimes like my Stingray, which is a, a an unusual. It's kind of a diamond shaped thing. Um, I originally arrived at that design drawing on a piece of paper, like what I thought in my head would be the most symmetrical layout. Um, it ended up to be. I don't know. I like to, I like to think of my products like little metallic sculptures that play sound, you know? Um, and I like to embrace the visual artistic side of me as well as the scientific side of me in creating unusual looking products that sound awesome. So I, the aesthetics are polarizing. They're not for everybody. I know there's a lot of audiophiles that are very traditional and they get afraid of new things and uh <laughs> that's fine too um i'm i'm the one making you know the products that do are not in a little rectangular box and don't look like a toaster oven and if that's attractive to your aesthetic well thank you but i accept that not everybody you know goes that way we who come <laughs> a we who come from a family of graphic designers namely my father having worked for, of all places, Popeil, 
So he's one of the people behind the pocket fisherman and other stuff in terms of design for, for stuff like okay. that. Okay. <laughs> That's kind of the vision that I have to look at when I think of your products in terms of its aesthetic, in terms of its 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 uniqueness. That goes to the to the first product that we started carrying for you guys, which was the recently introduced uh, Manly headphone amplifier. Now that's a territory that for can jammers and others who are exploring headphone and, and you know, personal audio enjoyment, this thing is not your average little you know box of chocolates. This is a beautifully <laughs> sculpted slope design, triangular in formation with an array of tubes that's simply you know simply done. But you also have certain flexibilities to it, and I think that's probably one of the, you know, again, redeeming factors why your products for me on a personal level have been, you know, dare I say it, some of the sexiest stuff I've ever seen. It's uh, it's really, you know, it's really, it's it's really beautiful to look at, but also great to listen to. Um, how did the headphone amplifier come about? Great question. Thank you. Um, I remember having this conversation in my kitchen with. Uh, the guy who used to work for me that did the visual design on that, um, Zia. And we had a, a notebook out and we were having this discussion about why are all these audiophile products always a square box that looks like a toaster oven. And, and I remember drawing something that was like a shoe or a boot saying, you know, why can't we have something that looks like a roller skate? And actually the working name for that product while we were developing it was, uh, SK eight was going to be the serial code prefix. And in fact, I was thinking of calling it the skate, which is also a double play on an aquatic creature. That's kind of like a stingray, right? Okay. So, um, anyway, he, he designed the aesthetics of the unit at the same time we mandated that we're going to use our brand new power supply that we're even advertising it here, manly power. And this power supply is a switching power supply that was designed for us by the worldwide expert in this technology, and that's Bruno Putzies. And he's a brilliant guy. If you've never met him, go find him at the next trade show that you can possibly go to. He's uh, now the brains behind the key speaker, K-I-I. And though he's a brilliant, brilliant man. And... Um, has a particular expertise in switch mode power supply design. So having befriended him at these trade shows over the years, I asked Bruno, hey, man, can you make a, uh, a power supply, you know, for vacuum tubes? Like we need 300 volts and we need lots of amps for the heaters and so on. And he says, uh, yeah, I don't see why not. So we worked on that project together and came up with this amazing power supply. And the sonic shootouts every time, it wins over the older linear technology. So we're here to tell you that message. So that was the first thing with the headphone amp is we, it needed to run off of that power supply. And it was the first time that we were deploying that power supply for a little power amplifier. Before that, it had been for basically single ended line level things. And this is the first time we were using it for a, a little baby push pull amplifier that can also switch to single ended. So that was another sonic trick that we pulled off in the headphone amplifier was the ability to switch topology, which is something that David came up with in the nineties with those 300 B amps. And then of course, because we build equalizers, look behind me, there's the guts of the manly massive passive equalizer. We thought, yeah, let's just put a little equalizer in here so you can custom tailor the sounds in your cans and uh, then the feature creep did take over. We admit there's a lot of features on there. There's, and that's, that's to please the audiophiles. Everyone, audiophiles love to play with their gear and tinker with it and get dial in the right sound. So Wait, that unit is very I'm not, I'm flexible. Not, I'm a purist. I, I don't, I don't touch anything. I just want to hear it all natural. There's buttons. <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of buttons, but that brings me to like, uh, as soon as we get freed up, we'll probably do another version of that of that product mainly for the pro audio market, you know, with very much scaled down cosmetics, you know, uh, less complicated to fabricate and less expensive. And we'll, we'll take, we'll probably be taking off a lot of those features for, for just a, you know, straight game block. Here's your awesome sounding headphone amp. So that's in the works. Well, there, there you go. Um, 
So I guess I need to ask at this point, of all the products that you've been manufacturing, whether it is in pro audio, whether it is in your consumer level kind of stuff, what piece of equipment are you most proud of in the company's operational history? Is it a, is it a previous model? Is it is a piece that, that now is the result of that, of that piece coming out? Got a lot of cool things we've done over the years. There's a lot of... I don't know. There, there's an old saying like, it's okay to be the first, it's okay to be the best, but if you can be the first and be the best, you'll have a successful product. Um, we had a lot of first in our history. Like I was the first, we were the first like tube D to A converter using the ultra analog chipset, put it that way. I also put a volume control on that and made an analog and digital preamp out of that. I was kind of the first to do that back in the olden days. And then commercially with a product that we called the wave at the time. Um, you know, going back to the first conversation we had, um, the manly Vox box, which is a combo recording piece. It's a high end mic pre compressor EQ and limiter and DSer. That one was totally fueled by my desire for revenge by success with David Manley. Like, I'm going to design this big, huge, three rack units tall, very dynamically interesting visually, you know, and totally kick ass with it. And so I did that in 1997. It's still a successful product today. And it tells it internally. It tells that story I was telling you about <laughs> and, um, the process, you know, I, I drew that faceplate out with a pencil on paper back then we ended up machining the first prototype of the unit on manually with our Bridgeport mills, which is very difficult to get all those curves and things. We have like rot rotary tables and things that we did that with. I mean, these days it's a snap with CNC machines, but in those days we used to hand prototype, um, that we've sold thousands of box boxes over the world, over the years around the world. And, um, it's create that unit's created tons and tons of wonderful records and been used in live sound as well for tons of concerts you might've been to. I'm really proud of that unit because it's complicated and, uh, whatever, 25 years later. So it's still rocking. Well, there you go. There's nothing wrong with a rockin' product like that having been on the market as long as it has. So you're here, I'm there. The I think one of the things I, I, I want to ask is, and I hope I'm sensitive in asking this, and I apologize in advance if I don't. As a woman running a business, the impetus to be challenged by others, does that cause you to think, I've done too much. I don't want to do any more. Is, is there, you know, is there, do you take challenges more now than ever before since, uh, since running the company now? I don't know, man. I've been doing it for so long. I don't think anything's changed recently. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've been like hanging out with all the guys for all these decades as well. And I guess decently accepted by the communities, the pro audio and the audiophile communities. Um, I don't know. Sometimes when I'm on these women in audio panels, it's like, I, I don't think about what gender I am when I'm working. I'm just working and creating and I'm just me. Like that's not the forefront of my thought process when I'm working on a project like that. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. I, I kind of maybe downplay that in my own head, put it that way. That's good. And maybe that that's maybe that's why I'm just I'm I'm my own unique individual, I suppose. <laughs> I can I can say that with absolute certainty from the very first time we met, there was this incredible eclecticism, a very dynamic energy, but a person who was also built to create to create products and to deliver a sound quality that could be second to none for a lot of people. And I say this because whenever I take a phone call 
uh, you know, within our sales team to address an issue on matching something when they tell me it's going to be running with a steelhead or if it's going to, you know, like a shrimp or, or other type, you know, type products, the emotional ooh la la from them is, <laughs> it's just shatter. And they, they get a, they get a, you know, they get a sense of knowing that this product was put together by somebody who really put it, you know, put it together both on the design board and also on the manufacturing end. And it shows in every piece of equipment. Um, quality, contr quality control on this. I mean, you know, you talk about manufacturing, you've talked about your team, what, you know, what goes into making sure that this product gets into their hands is fully baked and is as reliable as you can, as you can make it for the dollar. Yeah. Well, I, you know, that after I learned how to physically wire up equipment and build boards and screw things together, the, the next job I had was on the quality control line. And, um, you know, I, I wrote my own test procedures out for each piece of gear at times back in the early nineties, some of these products would hit my QC bench and nobody had even driven, drawn out a, a schematic for them yet. Like David would just make a board with black tape and clear film and all of a sudden we're building 50 of these new things and maybe everything wasn't worked out yet. <laughs> and certainly a schematic had not been documented yet. So I, that was a very important job for me. And I also knew that if I missed something or if something broke later, the customer would be on the phone with me. So I, I took that very seriously and personally in those early days. And then eventually when I trained other, other engineers to, uh, to learn how to do, how to perform the quality control job, um, you know, I was, I was there working within six feet of them back in the days you could be just six feet to each other. Um, so I, I could, you know, say, Hey, Umberto, you stuck on that? What's going on over there? And he goes, Oh, I'm not getting signal onto the right channel here. And I could pop over and help him. And Oh, that cap, look at that one right there, you know, or help him go in the right direction. So I've been like, I've done the job. I've trained my QC team over the years and still today, I monitor all of the service requests that come through. And while I have a service team that takes care of things, I'm still keeping my eyeball on it because I want to look for for problem children. I want to look for systemic failures. I want to look for trends so that we can immediately jump on problems and solve those in production. So we've got a great team these days. I've got Umberto, who I trained up from a QC guy. He's a double E engineer. And I've got a new new guy as of last September, Jeffrey Bork, who worked with API for 20 years and has, yeah, 30 something years experience in the audio business. And um, you know, and we've got some other guys that work out that we other consultants we bring in as well. But um as a team, we've really reorganized ourselves in the last year. We're using monday.com to centralize all our communication. That's important too. And we're just, we're staying on top of issues. That's a thing. And sometimes these things take a while to, to figure out or to solve, but, um, quality control is insanely important to me because I, I know it's like, if there's one bad thing that's that gets out on the internet, you know, it takes a hundred good praises to undo that one, that one time that one thing broke, you know? Yeah, no, and I understand it. Honestly, that's, that's hey, break. stuff happens, tubes die, sometimes because humans built this gear, there might be, you know, a bad, bad solder joint right there. It might have gotten through, you know? These are humans making this stuff, not machines and not robots, so... Sometimes a little understanding uh, is appreciated from from the customer, although I know it's frustrating to get something and it's not working 100. percent I mean that's it. That said, we keep data on all this stuff. Our failure rate out of the box is normally around one percent. That's pretty commendable for hand built gear. I think it's all right, but um, if it were zero percent, I'd be even happier. But that's what we work on every day. It's a very, very important part of the company. That's that's wonderful. I want to I want to pop something on our display here. This came to us from one of our viewers, uh, 
uh, Jerry Nemeth, and he writes, I remember using my manly neoclassic 250s and Ivana telling me not to run them balanced because there was a transformer that came into play <laughs> and they sounded better single-ended. And he goes on to say, all news to me is I thought balanced would be better. Uh, it, it, it is kind of a, a unique role when we talk about balanced versus unbalanced and the ultimate voicing. Uh, does that also help when you're trying to make informed decisions for customers and or people in the design team in situations like that? Yeah, I, I tend to gravitate towards the single-ended circuits for the simplicity, also for the second harmonic as opposed to the third and odd order harmonics that you're going to get with push-pull circuits. Um, I tend to go for less is more, so I'd rather not have to listen to that input transformer if I can come straight into the RCA, right? Um, I think a, sometimes I think some guys get really anchored into the the balance thing because they've bought balance cables <laughs> and they don't want to either re-terminate them or buy other cables and their cables are very expensive. So I can understand, I can understand that. Um, I don't think there should be a universal proclamation that all balanced circuits sound better or all single ended circuits sound better. I just know in my experience, I, I think I get more clarity and pureness out of a line level device with a single ended circuit. Um, we do deploy push pull circuits and line level devices like in the manly variable mu. And that's a very special device. Uh, the way the tube is making the gain change to be to it's a limiter and compressor. And also that is a coloration device. It is something that creates a sound when you're recording. So it's a, it's a different application. That same circuit in a hi-fi situation um you can hear that color and to me the simple the simplicity of say the the manly jumbo shrimp which is single-ended circuit it would it would beat that push pull circuit circuit for circuit so maybe you might need to change your cables that was discussed by that by that individual later on so <laughs> i think that's uh i think that's uh that's pretty cool uh we've got a couple more minutes here before we sign off but uh I'm, I'm curious, uh, with all the shows basically on hiatus through 2021 in many cities throughout the United States, and certainly you know, as we you know, trundle through 2020, which I'd like to just simply say is a write-off, um, <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to ask, what is on the drawing board for Ivana Manley product-wise? What, what is going to be out there for us to, you know, get a sneak peek at, or was there something planned to be making its way into, into that universe, uh, you know, before all this mess hit? Uh, yeah, we've been a hundred percent on the case. Actually, I've been paying my engineers overtime, as I can see. Um, we've been developing these three new audiophile preamplifiers. So one of them will be a, a brand new phono stage only kind of like the Chinook, uh, but with lots more features and remote control loading and all that. The other product will be a replacement for the Manly Jumbo Shrimp, which will be a line stage only, and also radio frequency remote control and lots of lots of changeable features as well. A lot, a lot of things, a lot of inputs and outputs and switching capabilities and all. And then the third product, which is the big boy that we're prototyping right now, that is a combination phono and line stage. So look, the new phono stage, it's not going to be as inexpensive as the Chinook. Okay. It's got lots more features and so on. So it, it's not, it's not per se a replacement for the, the good old Chinook, but it does give you all the control remote control ability of loading and gain changing and all that kind of stuff. So these are all, all three of these preamps have our new switching power supply. They're running off of that. And again, I've done these listening tests, you know, with a last one I did was a linear supply Chinook. And then we modded one to take the new switching power supply. And I went down to 
Pete Lyman's Infrasonic Mastering Studio in L.A. Listen, we listened to that on records he had cut there. And we both heard every time that linear supply is better. It's faster, zippier, ballsier. It just, everything about it sounded better, the clarity, all that. So these three new audiophile preamps are based on that new power supply. And I think we're on the forefront of that, at least in the tube world. There's not a lot of audiophile uh, vacuum tube companies embracing the future like we are. So we're, we're trying to bridge that future in the past, you know, with vacuum tubes, archaic vacuum tubes and transformers and there's nothing capacitors. About and then we're in the future with the switch mode power supply. There's, so. there's nothing wrong and with a vacuum radio tube. frequency remote controls and <laughs> FCC certification. All those things. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> all all the things. Oh, Modern no. databases. <laughs> with all with all that with all that design and with all that energy that you're putting into all these great products, which I'm obviously looking forward to seeing as it as it comes to market, is still finding time to ride a motorcycle these days? What are what you know, how how is that handling uh, in, in this whole situation? Well, barely. I actually started up my bikes for the first time last weekend because I have a ride coming up on Saturday with my Pasadena Motorcycle Club. And uh, it's the annual Greenhorn Motorcycle Ride, and it's going to culminate in a camp out up in the Sequoias. Um, this year, I've, I've just, to be responsible, I've stayed home. I've tried not to take any extra risk. Um, you, you know, going out or riding my motorbikes, I don't want to, I haven't wanted to do anything that might risk me getting into a hospital. Okay. So I've been a good citizen with that stuff. Um, during this lockdown, holy crap, I have never worked so many hours in my whole life. Every day is 10 to 12 hours. That's a short day up to 20, I worked 21 hour day, two weeks ago, 19 hours. I mean, I cannot keep up with my correspondence and my work. And, you know, there's all the zoom conferences and, you know, we've got to communicate and I do so much, I just communicate all day and I can't keep up with all the communication. So help. <laughs> But but the dog. I have no I have no life. You, you have the dog. I, I, you've got a great home. You've you've got all the comforts. You know there, there must. I do, be, there must and be I some, have some relax. Zero time to enjoy any of that, oh. and um, it's I help. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope this hour gave you I a little bit a of grace to uh, to be able to uh, to spend with us and to tell us your story. Um, this hour has been remarkable. Uh, I, I, again, as I said at the onset, uh, it's been great to know you as both uh, dinner guest, as pal sitting in a room and chilling out and talking, uh, you know, cutting loose, you know, talking, talking your talk. And uh, I would not be able to do this kind of an interview, uh, albeit slightly nervous with a cup of coffee, <sighs> uh, in order to in order to get ready to talk with you. Uh, so I am humbly and thankful that I could have this opportunity <laughs> with you. Um, you are Thanks, amazing. Bess. Um, You've given me an opportunity, so thank you. <sighs> Twerk nothing. You know, <laughs> it's it's all music direct bandwidth from here. <laughs> so it's, it's, that's really how that works. Thank you, Ivana <laughs> Manley. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Just a quick heads up on what's going on. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we close out our week. Uh, with Greg Stidson and Marshall Courier of NAD and Blue Sound uh, and their parent company on how things are going up north and how they've been adapting to the situation and how they've also mastered the art of product training and helping good folks like you and I enjoy some of the latest cutting edge products from them. So from all of us here at Music Direct in Chicago and all of us who visit on our website at musicdirect.com, Call our toll-free 800 number at 1-800-449-8333 during normal business hours. And to you good folks over there in Manly Labs watching us on your Facebook page, thanks for watching and have yourself a great day. And of course, be safe. <laughs>